Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Megillas Echa. I have a thing for uh, books about destruction and suffering and torture. So, <laughs> no, um, obviously, it's 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 never pleasant to uh, to say those words. Welcome to Megillas Echa, but it is Rosh Chodesh Thomas today, which which means which means that in only a few weeks. Thankfully, you know, we still got a month and maybe the base of Mikdash will be rebuilt before then. But only a few weeks, of course, will be morning Shisha B'Av. Only two and a half weeks will begin Shavas Arba Tammuz, which is the period of the year in which we focus specifically on the destruction of the Mikdash and the exile of our people and all sorts of other horrible things. Um, and so I thought, therefore, it would be appropriate to learn Megillas Echa um, for that reason and also because much as it is not pleasant, it is a book of profound theological and spiritual significance that I think is a very fruitful study. So today we're going to do a bit of an introduction we're not going to get so much, so far into the book itself. So if you have a Tanakh today, we're also going, we're today we're going to, in terms of our in-text learning, we're going to spend most of our time looking at Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu Parak Lamed Vav. But I'm going to, I like, I need to begin with the first uh, verse. I do believe in opening the text and, and, and getting right in there. So let's begin with that. The very first Pasuk in Eicha. You know, I almost attempted to read it in the tune, but I feel like you shouldn't do that unless it's Tisha B'Av. It's, it's still Rosh Chodesh. It's a happy day today. So I'll just read it in prose. Sorry, Rabbi, are you doing Yermiyahu or are you doing Eicha? Right now I'm going, okay. thank you. Thank you. No, that's a good question. Thank you. I'm going to begin the very first verse of Eicha. Oh, good. Okay. For some reason, I thought Yermiyahu. Okay. And can you give... No, afterward, though. So okay, hold on. can you give the chapter and verse in of English? Course I I will. Of, verse. of course I will. Of course I will. Okay, thanks so much. Of course. So let's begin. Echa Yashva Badad. You know, I look at this English translation. It has the word alas. I think that's a bit of a cop-out. Um, I'm going to choose that. At, I'm going to translate the word Echa as how. How, from the word ech, which means how. How she can sit alone in solitude. The city that was great with people has become like a widow. The great Great one among the nations, Sarati Bamedinot, a princess among states, Haita Bamas, has become a tributary, a nation that needs to pay tribute to others. That is as far as we're going to get in Echa today, ladies and gentlemen, but I am happy that we began. Let's focus on that first word for just a minute. You know. You probably are familiar with this Migilah, which we read on Tisha B'Av at night, of course, as Migilat Echa. It is interesting to note that our rabbis of blessed memory, Chazal, did not refer to this book as Migilat Echa. They called it Keynote or Sefer Keynote. That's why in your English Tanakh, the English name for the book is Lamentations. A uh, kina is a lament. Lamentations is not a translation of the word echa. Lamentations is a translation of the word kinot. So, for example, in the Gemara in Bava Batra, which is a fascinating piece in which the Talmud enumerates the order of the books in Tanakh and also ascribes authorship to each of these books, right? Moshe wrote the five books of the Torah and he wrote Eov and it goes on and on. Very worthwhile reading. It's Baba Basra, Yudalit Amid Bet. I believe it begins. 
very worthwhile to see. Very interesting things. Like for, for one, if I were to ask you who wrote Migilat Esther, this is just parenthetically, what would you say? I don't know, Mordechai, I don't know. That seems like a reasonable reasonable answer. In truth is, the Gemara says it was <laughs> Anshin Kineta Tagadola, the men of the wow. greatest army. Fascinating, right? The same thing with Yechezkel, by the way, which of course we spent a lot of time learning together. You would say Yechezkel wrote Yechezkel, and it clearly was the words of Yechezkel, but the Gemara says the actual compilers of the book of Yechezkel was Again, the Anshe Knesset Aydola. Anyways, when it tells us who wrote Eicha, it says Yirmiyahu wrote Eicha. It doesn't say Eicha. It says Kinot. Yirmiyahu wrote his book, and Melachim, the book of kings, and Kinot. So it is worth considering why we refer to the book as Eicha. What do you think? Why do we refer to this book as Eicha? Why not go with the terminology our great rabbis and sages use it's a very painful word because it it it, it invokes confusion how come what's ah. what's the issue here what's happened why okay. you know ralph you're, you're too profound for me you know i was hoping <laughs> some people would give a simple answer my friend ralph here is so deep and philosophically inclined that he went for something much more profound right away. So I agree with what you said. I want to get to it. I think the word Eicha very appropriately conveys the emotions that this book is trying to convey. And I want to, at the end of our learning today, sort of pin down that question of what emotions specifically it does convey. Because so I think that's an important thing to um, ask. But, but I do think you're right. Let's focus. There are some simple answers, though. Like somebody who was not quite as profound as Ralph might have said, well, it's the first word in the book, which is a convenient way of referring to a sefer, right? We call many of our parshiot by not necessarily the first word, but the most significant word in the first verse. This parsha, this week, we're going to read Korach. Why do we call it Korach? Well, the second word is Korach, by Yikach Korach. You're not going to call it Vayikach. That's a very common, insignificant word, and he took. But Korah seems like a pretty important word, and it does actually um, faithfully convey the theme of the book. It's not just Echa, by the way, that is uh, not just the first chapter, rather, that begins Echa. Indeed, if you look, if you're familiar, Perak Bet also begins Echa with the word Echa. Perak Dalid also begins with the word Eicha. And all three of those chapters, in terms of their structure, are begin with the word Eicha. They're written similarly, and they also are all written in basically alphabetical order, although the letter Pe comes before the letter Ayin, which points to the unity of this, of this book. Um, so there are three chapters beginning with the word Eicha, and then, as Ralph, I think, very astutely suggests, Eicha, I think the expression, Eicha, how, how, very much does convey the, the emotion that we, we that, that Yirmiyahu wants us to feel as we read the book. So I actually, before we get into a little bit more of, of what I want to show you from Yirmiyahu, I want to ask another question. You hear somebody says, how? How can this have happened? Okay, how did this happen? Is that a reaction to an expected occurrence or a sudden occurrence, usually? What would you say? Like, when you say, oh my gosh, how could this have happened? Would you expect that to uh, a person to react in that way after something that has been on the horizon for a long time? just happened to them? Or is it something that you would generally respond to that when something happens suddenly? I think both. Both, okay, that's fair. That's I think fair. initially it's- oh, It's a surprise. Immediately. You don't expect right. it. Think how could we have let ourselves get to this? Like how could- Okay, good, good, good. We didn't, good. See, so we didn't observe the red flags. 
Ralph says it's a surprise. I saw Vanessa was shaking her head before, so she also thinks it's a good response to a surprise. Robbie says both. So here's the thing. This was not sudden. This was not sudden at all. There is, it, it is impossible to say this was sudden. The, you might even argue the majority of, of, of prophets is dedicated to warning the Jewish people about the, not, that's a bit of an overstatement, but warning the Jewish people about their impending doom due to their sin. It's not like no one warned them about this. They had been warned about this repeatedly. Furthermore, it's not as if this was the first catastrophic event, you know, that, that, that was the start of a downfall, destruction, exile. In fact, it's quite the opposite. There were many events that led up to this politically, which were horrifically catastrophic. Anyone think of any? Any uh, cataclysmic, destructive events that any Jewish person would have been very sensitive to who was living at this time period, right? The time period of the destruction of the first temple, approximately 587 BC. Was it wasn't, wasn't the Assyrians? Good. There? Excellent. Karen. They came so, along. 100%. So that's first of all, there are, we usually say there are 12 tribes, maybe 13 if you count Ephraim and Manasseh and Levi. But the point is, there were two kingdoms, and an entire northern kingdom was exiled, right? By Sanchirev, king of Assyria. So there was the Assyrian conquest that happened a few generations earlier. And a great part of the kingdom was totally exiled. They're gone. That was really like, and nothing like that had ever happened. I'm very much indebted, I should say, to uh, ya Dr. Yael Ziegler, who has a wonderful uh, series of classes she wrote on uh, the Har Etzion website on Echa. And this is the way she, be she begins with this historical introduction, um, noting that this was really the third event in a number of catastrophic events. So then the first is this, this exile of the 10 tribes. And if you think of it in this way, that really you can trace all the way back to Abraham, right? Avraham Avinu, the first of the forefathers, a trajectory of the fulfillment of a prophecy for the Jewish people's destiny. Since Avram Avinu was promised that he would have a nation, etc., of course, there were ups and downs along the way, but they were all ups and downs. Really, since Avram Avinu first saw God and had a nevuah, and Hashem promised him a number of things. In fact, I'll tell you that the Akedat Yitzchak, Yitzchak Arama, it's a 15th century philosopher, he specifically argues that Echa is about how the three things that Hashem promised to Avram Ravinu, unique relationship with God, offspring, and the land of Israel, were all taken away from the Jewish people, and that Echa, Echa is sort of a description of how, of how that happened, or the reaction to when that happened, a mourning for the loss of the blessings that Hashem had given to Avram Ravinu. But the point is, really since the time of Avram Avinu, the Jews had been experiencing the realization of that prophecy. So they have all of a sudden Avram Avinu's descendants become a nation and they get the Torah. And yes, there are ups and downs, but they get into Israel and they conquer Israel and they set up a kingdom. And really for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Jews had an autonomous, generally, kingdom in the land that Hashem had promised to their forefathers, and they had a temple. And yes, they were sinful, and there were ups and downs, and they lost battles, and they won battles, and of course, the kingdom split, and that was not great. But they, they had this, the realization of the vision that Hashem had told to Avram Avinu. And then, and then the Jews are kicked out. Ten tribes are kicked out. They no longer live in Israel. They're gone, not even heard from, almost like from history. And Sanchirev takes control of the kingdom. So that is the first catastrophic event that she, um, that Yael Ziegler points to, and that 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 led up to this. That that, that happened well before the destruction of the base of Mikdash. 
And in fact, and, and we noted this when those of us who are with us learned Yechezkel together, Yechezkel and other Nevi'im too specifically rebuke the other kingdom, the kingdom of Judea, Yehuda, and Benjamin, who you know, lived in the part of Israel where there was a base on Mikdash and a temple, but he specifically, they are specifically rebuked for not taking to heart what happened to the northern kingdom. Meaning to say, they witness what happened to them, and yet the prophets say, you're just as bad, you're just as sinful, and if you don't shape up, the same will happen to you too. So that's first of all. Second of all, and this is referred to specifically in Eicha, you had the murder or killing of Yoshiahu, Melech Yoshiahu, who was really the last righteous king. Um, and Yoshiahu Melech was this incredibly inspiring monarch who inspired this great shuva movement among the Jewish people, one of the last kings of Malchut Yehuda, um, and he, re, you know, refurbishes the temple and he gets rid of all the idolatry, and it's this really hopeful time for the Jewish people that the tides are turning. And then in a very, in something that we lament about on Tisha B'Av, and in fact, in Divrei Hayamim specifically, which is evidence, part of the evidence for the fact that Yirmiyahu did indeed write Eicha, which is the assumption we're going to go with, in um, your, the, 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 the Tanakh tells us that Yoshiyahu, when he was killed, let me say that explicitly. Yoshiahu is, is asked by the king of Egypt that um, the king of Egypt asked Yoshiahu if he can go through the land of Israel on totally as almost like a shortcut on his way to a battle. And Yoshiahu tragically refuses to let him do so. And he fights with the king of Egypt and he's killed. He's killed in the battle. And in Devei HaYamim, the Navi tells us, Vayikonein Yirmiyahu al Yoshiah. Right? That Yoshiahu the king lamented about the death of Yosh, of excuse me, Yirmiyahu, the, the prophet, lamented about the killing of Yoshiahu Hamela. Right? The word Kina, Vayikonein. Um, this, that is why, partially why, many, and we'll get to more of this in just a couple of moments, many assume that the third chapter in Eicha is this lament, is the lament referred to in Devrei Hayamim, that Yirmiyahu, this is his expression of what Yirmiyahu was feeling when Yoshiyahu Amalek was killed. So that was a few, a few kings before destruction of the temple. And this is incredibly traumatic. This is this righteous king Things are looking good, and he's killed. So all of this is to say that this was not sudden in many senses. This was not something that should have been sudden, at least. This is something that they ought to have expected. And yet, it begins Eicha. So I want to get back to that. But now, I believe that we have to. We can't begin Eicha without looking at Yirmiyahu chapter 36, Parak Lamed Vav. So that is what we're going to do. If you open to Yirmiyahu, you go to Parak Lamed Vav. This really is a very essential introductory Parak to Megillah Echa. And um, I think it's essential to our understanding of what we're about to read and how painful it truly is. So for those who do have a stone, so I have a stone Tanakh, it's on page 1,158. I'm going to try to read through it carefully, pretty swiftly with you. So here it goes. Perak Lam and Vav, do we have it? Chapter 36, verse 1 in your Miyahu, reads as follows. It was the fourth year of Yehoyakim, Son of Yoshiahu, king of Yehuda, right? So this is the after Yoshiahu was killed. Um, it's a bad time. 
it's a bad time. Your Miyahu has been giving a lot of a lot of rebukes to Jewish people, and they're not listening. And it's the fourth year of Yoyakim. Yoyakim was Yoshio's son. It wasn't his name, he was given that name, but that's for another time. Yoyakim was not a righteous king. The following matter came to your Miyahu, from God saying, Kaslacha Migilat Sefer. Take for yourself a scroll. And you should write on the scroll all of the things that I have spoken to you about Israel and about Yehuda and about all the nations. From the time I spoke to you in the days of Yoshiahu and until today. Maybe the house of Judah will hear about all the evil that I have thought to do to them. So that they should repent, each person from their evil way. And I will forgive them for their sins. Okay? So Hashem tells Yirmiyahu to write a bunch of different prophecies that apparently describe that, that, that Hashem has essentially been talking to him about for a long time and that these prophecies describe what Hashem th- is considering doing all the evil that he's considering bringing upon the house of Judah right any candidates for what might be written on that Megillah thoughts well we'll get We'll return to it in a moment. So that's this is a, a scroll. Now something very interesting happens here. It's a bit troublesome. It says by Yikra Yirmiyahu at Baruch ben Neria. Yirmiyahu calls Baruch ben Neria. By Baruch mipi Yirmiyahu. Baruch writes down this the words of this scroll from the mouth of Yirmiyahu, meaning Yirmiyahu is saying these words. Baruch is writing them. It called the Rey Hashem Asher Dibere, I love on Megillat Sefer. All the words of God that he had spoken to him on a scroll. Does that bother anyone, by the way? What troubles you about verse 4? Come on, guys. What troubles you about verse 4? Ask me a question, Ralph. What troubles <laughs> you about verse 4? <laughs> if somebody else is writing, Thank he doesn't you. have Thank you. He, he doesn't God have to. Not he doesn't say, have to say, write down exactly what he's heard. Well, on a very basic level, is a Yermio is Yermio following Hashem's instructions here? No, he's he not. Goes, no. When did Hashem say that someone else should write it down? Um, this is not an easy question. I saw this morning that the Akedat Yitzchak suggests that Yermio. You have to understand the context here. Your Mio's had a long career telling the Jewish people that they're sinning. Unfortunately, it hasn't been very successful. Uh, and they have not listened to him. And they have not heeded his they voice. Haven't, they haven't listened. No, they no, haven't listened not to not him. Not at all. In fact, he was born in prison. And he's, he's going to tell prison, him he's yeah. in prison. And so your Mio, with Ruach HaKodesh, suggested that instead of him writing this down, if the purpose is to get the Jews to repent, he gives it to Baruch ben Neria, who was apparently somebody who was respected, a part of, you know, the uh, the royal court, somebody who had in, and somebody who was a righteous person. And so that he'll dictate what Hashem told him, and Baruch will write it and share it with the people. Because that's the point. Hashem says, maybe they'll do teshuva. But really, uh, very interesting. Anyways, let's see what happens. But you cry your cake. Maybe a, can I ask go a question? It, maybe a shim it, should maybe a shim should have given Yemiahu charisma. Maybe didn't have enough charisma to, know, to persuade people. people <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I shouldn't tell the Navi what to say and they have to figure out the best way to deliver the message, but I'm with you. But it's a very your meow with Baruch Limor. Your meow commands Bar saying, Aniat Sor, I am imprisoned. Apparently, Yermiyahu was in yeah. prison. I can't go to the house of God. 
Uvasata, you should go. Vikarasa ba Megillah, Sherkasata Mipi. You should read from the Megillah that you have written from my mouth. At Tivrei Hashem Boaznei'am, the words of God in the ears of the nation, Beit Hashem Biyom Som, in the house of God on the day of a fast. Is this a the fast of Yom Kippur? Was this another fast that they proclaimed specifically? It's, 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 not, it's not very clear. Some don't translate the word Som as a fast, but that's for another time. Vegan Ba'oz, they call you Da, read it in the heirs of Judah. Coming from their cities, read it. Maybe their words of prayer will, will come before God, will quarrel in front of God. Each person will do tshuva from their evil way. The great is the anger and wrath that Hashem has spoken about this nation. Baruch Baneir did everything that your Mio and Avi commanded him to do. Likro Basefer Devri Hashem Beis Hashem to read in the Beit Hashem in the Beis of Mikdash from this book of God. Wow, let's see what happens. Vayehi Bashana Hachamishit, it's the fifth year. So a lot of time elapses. We began the fourth year, it's the fifth year. Lilio Yakim Ben Yoshia, Melch Yudab Achorash Hachi'i. Of Yoshiahu, the uh, of Yehoyakim, the son of Yoshiahu, king of Yehuda, on the on the ninth month, Karut Som of Hashem Kalam Yerushalayim. They declared a fast day in front of God, all the nation of Yerushalayim. V'chol ha'am ha'ba'im me'arei Yehuda Yerushalayim. Good. So this was a fast day. So that that's sort of Baruch Benaria's cue, right? They proclaimed a, they proclaimed a fast day, likely because of some of the hardships that they were experiencing, and they proclaim a fast day, and so this is Baruch's opportunity. Good. So Baruch reads the words of Yermio in the house of God in the chamber of Gemar Yahu ben Shafan the Sofer in the upper courtyard near the entrance of the house of God, the new entrance, in the words of all the nations. Okay, so we're not so familiar with the geography, the topography of the Beis HaMikdash, but if you were, this is a specific place near the entrance, and Abraham Baruch is reading this, this book. Right, so Michayahu, the son of Gimar Yahu, referred to in the previous verse, at Kol Devei Hashem Sefer, he hears everything, he hears this book, he hears this book that's being uh, written. Ring red. He goes to the house of the king, right? He goes to the base of Mikdash to the palace, to the, the chamber of the Sofer. Right? So there's a Sofer, the scribe of the king, Gimar Yahu. That's uh, the, the, the father of this fellow, Micha Yahu. Basically, all these important people, nobility, dignified um, dignitaries are, are sort of hanging out here in this place in the palace. And uh, Michayahu goes to them. But Yagi Lehem Michayahu, it called very much Shemay, says, you know, I heard the craze, the most outrageous thing, most heart-rending thing at the temple. He tells them everything he heard. Right? Bikro Baruch Pasefer Bozniyam, and Baruch read this book to the, the words, the ears of the people. Right? So all these very important people send um, Yehudi and Netanyahu as messengers to Baruch, who's in the base of Mikdash, and they tell him, take your Megillah and come here. You want to hear it. You want to hear it ourselves. Wow. And he brought it to them. He came to them. But Yom Rilav, they said to him, Shave not sit. Do Karana Baznina read in our ears? But he grabbed Baruch Baznayim and Baruch obliges and he reads this scroll in their ears, in the town, in the palace to all these officers. Vayahi Kishoma Am. Behold, when they heard, call Hadvarim, all these things. Pacha do Isha they started trembling. Each man to his friend. Tell these things to the king. 
more. And to Baruch they asked, saying, or should we tell? They asked, sorry, we must tell. They say, we must tell the king all these things. And they asked Baruch, saying, What happened here? How did you write down all these things from, uh, from the Navi's mouth? What, what was the procedure? What exactly happened? Where's the source of all these things? What, what, like, is it, you know, it's almost like, is this a direct source? Like, how do you know all of this? Where'd you get this from? He read to me from his mouth. All these words. Almost as if to say, you know, he didn't have any text in front of him. He just read the words. These were prophecies. These were his prophecies from God. And I wrote down exactly what he wrote, what he said with on, on the Megillah, on the scroll. But Yomar Asrim al So the officer said, Baruch, Lechi Satera Tav Yirmiyahu. You guys go high, right? So you could tell, by the way, the officers were obviously very moved. They start trembling. They're moved. They're worried. They're scared. But they anticipate that the reaction of the king won't necessarily be so wonderful for Baruch and Yermia. So they say, go hide. The ish him, but let no one know where you are. Okay. They went to the, the to the court to the king in the courtyard. So they took the Megillah, they put it in the chamber of Eli Shama, the Sofer, the scribe. They told the king all these things. Melech sent this fellow Yehudi to take this scroll. So he retrieves the scroll. And Yehudi reads the scroll. He reads it to the king and to all the officers who are standing there in front of the king. How do you think king... This is a pivotal moment, right? A pivotal moment. You could think about the potential of this moment. All these clearly, you know, Baruch went to the base of Mikdash. He read this. It's made an impression on all the people that were in the temple. They were worried. They were afraid. They're, they're moved. It was a fast. He reads it to these other so, so him, these important um, scribes and officers. They're also moved. And now the king hears it. And the king has uh, decide, to decide how he's going to react to this Megillah. It's a pivotal moment. The Melech was singing in the in the winter room, literally translated, like in, 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 in a warm place where you would sit in the winter. In the ninth month. And the fire was burning in front of him. Right? Whenever Yehudi would read three or four columns, Blatot means columns, okay, he would, the king, the king would cut out the column with a scribe's razor. And throw the text into the fire. He burned it. He burned each column methodically. Until the whole scroll had been burnt on the fire in the fireplace. How do we have a copy of it, Rabbi, then? Hold on, hold your horses. You don't sorry, even know sorry. What it is, do you? <laughs> I think Brian crazy, know, too, you like that. <laughs> I think you're already making assumptions, but you don't, but, but, but uh, good question. I should say it's burned. They didn't, they weren't afraid. And they did not tear their clothing. The king and all his servants heard all these things. All these other scribes from the first group, they, they begged the king, don't burn this scroll. No, what are you doing? Below Shamali, he didn't listen. 
Okay, so Melech, the king, Yoshiakim, son of Yoshiahu. And you see, like, it's almost like the polar opposite, right? Yoshio was this person who saw the moment and he seized it and he tried to, and this is, the, you know, he tried to get everybody to do teshuva. And this king has the ultimate opportunity, and it's already begun. The movement's already begun, and he shuts, he shuts it down. And he commands Yerachmael, uh, his son, and Shrayahu, and Shalemyahu, these other people, to take Baruch HaSofer, Beit Yermiyahu, and Avi, and Jeremiah. I don't think, what it, to take them does not mean to take them and uh, honor them for the community service they had performed. It probably was not going to end well for them. Hashem hid them. Not a very encouraging story. It's devastating. It's really devastating to read. You think about what might have happened if Yehoiakim had responded differently. And you don't really have to guess because Hashem tells us what he wants to happen. He says, read this to them. Maybe they'll do tshuva. Right? Nope. And the word of God came to Yahu after the king had burnt the, uh, the scroll with all the things that Baruch had written, written from Yermiyahu's mouth. Take another scroll. You know, burning the scroll, it's almost like, you know, as if, as if Yehoiakim thought that if he just burned the scroll, then all the problems would go away. But that's not, that's not how it works. So the word of God came to Yermiyahu after the king had burnt the scroll. And what did he say? Pasuk Kavchet, verse 28. Take another scroll. Write all the things that were in the first scroll. Asher Saraf Yoyakim Melch Yudah. That Yehoyakim, king of Judah, had written. That, that, that had burnt. Whatever was in that first scroll, write it again. And you might say, like, that's a lot to ask. But, you know, as a Navi, Yermiyahu was pretty proficient at uh, remembering his prophecies. And he could apparently just ask, uh, ask Baruch to write them again. You should say, so says God. So this is a hint to what's in there, specifically. So what you said? Why'd you write this saying that the king of Babel will come and destroy the land of, destroy the, this land, and rid it of people and animals? Why'd you write that? What what, what is this about? Why'd you write that? Therefore, so says God. He will not have, he will no longer sit on the house of the, 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 the throne of David. His course will be thrown for uh, dra, um, you know, drought in the day and, and, and cold at night. I will, I will recount for, upon him and his, his children and his servants their sin. And I will bring upon them and the, descent, the, the citizens of Yerushalayim, the people of Judah, it call all the evil. All the evil that I spoke to them about, they didn't listen. Don't worry, it, it will all happen, and your corpse is going to be thrown in the fields. And he gave it to Baruch, son of Neria, the scribe. And he wrote on it from the mouth of Yermiyahu. He called the Riyasef. There are all the words of the book. The Yoyakim, king of Yehuda, burned in the fire. And he also added upon them many, many matters like that. Which is also an interesting question on itself. God did not say to add on anything. He just said, write what you wrote the first time. 
it probably had some sort of divine inspiration to do so. But that is the story I wanted to read with you. Let me return to the question, and I'm curious what you'll answer here, that I asked you a couple of minutes ago. What do you think was in that book? What might the contents of that, contents of that Migilah have been? The sins of the people. Okay. Exile and yeah. destruction of the temple. Okay, any other thoughts? The criticism of the king, like why did the king uh, react the way he did? It's almost like he was overreacting. Why? Well, I think he refused, uh, you know, denial. Denial. He tear it up, it didn't happen. Yeah, so no. I'm actually, exactly. I'm actually um, surprised. I thought, Robbie, you were saying this before. Um, Many understand, and Chazal, in a few places, understand that this Megillah was Megillah's Echa. Right? Your Miyahu, your Miyahu, the prophet, as according to our tradition, wrote Megillah's Echa. And there are parallels to his language. And your Miyahu, the prophet, wrote a Megillah clearly. It's the same time period. Um, and they also indicate that in the, this last verse, when it says he added many other things, so they argue that the Megillah originally only contained chapter one, chapter two, and chapter six, or excuse me, chapter four, chapter four, which are the three chapters that begin with Echa, and then the other matters that he added, are that refers to chapter three. Chapter three in Megillat Echa, which is a triple acrostic, right? In chapter three, it doesn't begin with the word Echa, it begins with the word Ani Hagether, I am the man. And where the only time in the Megillah where Yirmiyahu is speaking in the first person at his own experience. As someone who witnessed this exile, and that, that chapter, as opposed to the other chapters, which each have one verse with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Chapter three has three verses, each of each beginning with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so when we say he at, wrote words like these, maybe it refers to the fact that the chapter three is an equivalent in length to the other three chapters because as it has three chapters each of each of the letters of the alphabet. So many, including Rosh and others, suggest that that's uh, essentially Yirmiyahu wrote a the Megillah before the destruction actually happened. He burnt, they burnt the Megillah, and then Hashem had him write it again, and then it ended up describing what what did happen. Now Eben Ezra did, rejects this notion. He suggests that. Sort of like you were saying, Migilat Echa doesn't really refer to any specific um, king, doesn't refer specifically to Melech Bavel, doesn't refer to Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't, doesn't refer. So, so they, they see it. So he thinks that with this was some other scroll that was burnt. Be that as it may, returning to our first question, you know, it's so clear that. This this really should have been the opposite of sudden. Meaning to say, whether or not this Megillah is the same scroll that your Mio had already written before the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, the point is that he had clearly, very clearly communicated to the people about what was going to happen. And they even started doing shuva, and it all fell apart. So we return to sort of the Torah Echa, Ha, Ha. And you sort of think about what is that communicating? What is the, what is the goal of Echa? If I ask it that way, what's the goal of this book? What is the intention of it? Sarah? What's the goal of this book? What is the Navi trying to accomplish? <coughs> What what will occur if you go off the track, off the rail? Well, the thing is, Ralph, it already happened. 
by the time Eicha itself is written, right? It's no longer predicted. I know, but it, it's for the future. It isn't for the... Okay, possible. So I want to do some. I want to share with you an argument in the Midrash. One of the... So Eicha, um, there isn't that much like medieval commentary on it, interestingly. But one thing that we do have, which is the fascinating wealth of liter rabbinic literature is the Medrash on Echa. The Medrash on Echa Rabbah is dated back very early to the Mishnaic time period. Um, so it's a very early Midrash. And, and what's also fascinating about Midrash Echa is that the rabbis weaved in the words of Echa and the prophecies in Echa, which clearly are a reaction to the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. They connect those words to what they themselves experience during the time period of the second base on Mikdash when that was destroyed, right? Because the people who wrote the Mishnah and the Midrash, they're shortly after the second temple, which is to say that these ideas of destruction, like Ralph is saying, are enduring. They're not specific to any time period, which is important to note um, specifically to respond to the doubts that some raise about did Yirmiyahu write this? Does this even refer to the destruction? It's not even written about explicitly. Nebuchadnezzar is not mentioned. Babel is not mentioned. Yoshiyahu is not mentioned. But perhaps Yirmiyahu doesn't identify himself. But perhaps part of the reason for all of that is that this isn't only a mourning for any particular or one specific circumstance in history. It's also that, but it serves as a template for the mourning that the Jews do throughout their, their, their history whenever they suffer persecution. So it's not specific to any person or specific king. But I wanted to read you. So that is all a plug. That's all a plug for Medrash Echa, which is really wonderful. And you could get it in versions in English. Not necessarily so happy to read, but fascinating. I wanted to read the argument about in the Midrash about how to think about the word Eicha. So um, just give me one moment and I'll find it. Some very interesting things here. Um, here we go. Here it is. Okay, so it says, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Nechemia. Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Nechemia argue. Rabbi Huda Omer, Ein Lashon Echa, Ela Tochecha. The language of Echa is only a language of Tochecha. And anyone know what Tochecha is? It is a rebuke, you know, rebuke. Repentance. Rebuke. Rebuke. Right? Rebuke. Echa. How could this have happened? Isn't just isn't just, oh my gosh, this is so sad. It's how can we have let this happen? How do we let things get to this point? Meaning it's almost, you know, you all, most of you mentioned before, Eicha is almost usually a response to something sudden. And this is the opposite of sudden. And that's part of the point. How do we let this happen? That's a rebuke. Didn't you know this was going to happen? We had so many opportunities and we just ignored them. How could we have let it get to this point? And he brings a proof text from Yirmiyahu. Like you say in Yirmiyahu, how can, how can the wise people say, how can people say we're wise and we had the Torah of God with us? How can you say such a thing that you're keeping the Torah when you're so sinful? Meaning, how could you let this happen? How could you talk like this? How could you? That's the first explanation. Rabbi Nechemia Omer, Ein Lashon Echa Elakina. Nechemia says, no. The language of Echa is a lamentation. It's a language of mourning. Ay, how could this be? How could this be? How does the nation, the city that was filled with people, now sit alone? How is it empty? 
right? Like you say, and the proof text he brings, anyone want to guess what proof text might he bring to prove that the word or letter is Eicha can be a lamentation? Vayikra Hashem Elokim El Hadam, Vayomer Lo, Ayla Ayeka. Ayeka. Very famously, Ayeka is the same letters. The Lord God called to Adam Arishon, Adam the first, and said, Ayeka, where are you? And the language says, Oilacha, woe is to you. That was like that, 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 that Ayeka is also a lamentation. Hashem is saying, Oh my goodness, what happened? Where are you How at? Could this have happened? How could this have happened? Yeah. Where are you? Because Hashem knew where he was, but like, why, why are you hiding? Why are you hiding? Whoa, what happened? The Amatai Nev, okay. Hiding from your I'll, I'll sins. Share, I'll share with you another, um, just one second, Ralph, another fascinating argument here at the end of the Midrash. Actually, you know what? Let's hold that. I think these two different interpretations are really crucial to understanding Echa. And they point out Echa is sort of messy, meaning there isn't a clear approach that's consistent throughout the book. And many of these big theological questions are really simultaneously dealt with in almost contradictory ways. Like, we ask, where is God? How can God have done this? Then we say we deserved it, but is there any hope? But there is hope if we do tshuva. Um, and I think it points to the fact that when something like this happens, the reaction isn't going to always be consistent. And like part of it is, uh, part of the morning is, how could I have let this happen? Like, what, what, what did we do? How could we have done this where, where we're so sinful? Why didn't we do tshuva? Why didn't we stop this? Why didn't we correct things? Why didn't we keep the Megillah before it was burned? Why didn't we just respond when we saw the chant? And part of it is also just not worried necessarily about, you know, the theology of what can we do to make this better, but more about just experiencing pain and sorrow. It's a kina. It's a lament. Right? It's just, and that's what happens when people have a loss. It's just, I, it hurts so much. How could this have happened? And Echa's really mixed with both of those at the same time. Some of that, like, some of it is directed, it's thoughtful speculation, you know, was trying to think about these big issues. How could God let this happen? Can Hashem be our enemy? How could he let the, his chosen people sink to such levels? How can he let his temple be destroyed? Not only let it be destroyed, but destroy it. Or some of it is just, I. It's a lament. And I think both of those are really key to understanding Eicha. So please, Rabbi. God, in the coming weeks, we'll, wow. uh, we'll try hard. Uh, experience that, you... I think it's important to experience. To experience Eicha as a work of theology, which helps us to think about dealing with loss, responding to loss, thinking about shuva, but also just as an emotional reaction to a very tragic period in our people's history. So please, God, we'll pick up with that next week. I'm happy to say for a few questions. And, and Thank yes, you cool. for joining me and spread the word, please. So Rabbi, it's, yeah, you're saying it's about... How could God have done this to us? But they're never saying, and this has been the problem right through history, we've never taken responsibility. How could we have 